What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, continuing the reading of the Bitcoin Optech Group newsletter. Thank you very much to all the contributors and sponsors and founders of this awesome open source organization. Today, newsletter 39 on March 26, 2019. This week's newsletter links to a proposal to encrypt peer-to-peer -peer communication and describes Lightning Loop, a tool and service for withdrawing Bitcoins from a Lightning Network channel and an on-chain transaction. Also included are links to resources about BEC32 adoption, summaries of popular questions and answers from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange, and a list of notable code changes in popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Action items. Help test Bitcoin Core version 0.18, release candidate 2. The second release candidate for the next major version of Bitcoin Core has been released. Testing is still needed by organizations and experienced users who plan to run the new version of Bitcoin Core in production. Use this issue for reporting feedback. News. Version 2 of the peer-to-peer -peer transport proposal. Jonas Schnelli sent a proposed BIP to the Bitcoin Dev mailing list as a specific uh, list that, specific, that specifies an algorithm to be used to encrypt traffic between peers. It also specifies some of the minor changes to the creation of protocol messengers, such as allowing peers to use bandwidth saving short identifiers and eliminating the SHA-256 based checksum on messengers. As the AEAD based encryption scheme protects data integrity. The, pers the proposal is meant to replace BIP 151 and it contains links to an example implementation for Bitcoin Core and some benchmarks. See newsletter 10 for previous discussion about the peer to peer protocol encryption. Loop is announced. Lightning Lab has announced a new tool and service to facilitate submarine swaps, hash time-locked contract-based atomic swaps of off-chain Bitcoins for on-chain Bitcoins. In essence, Alice sends Bob a Lightning Network payment secured by a secret she knows, preventing Bob from claiming it. Bob then creates an on-chain payment that Alice can spend by revealing that secret. Alice waits for the payment to receive a suitable number of confirmations, and then she spends it on-chain to an address that she chooses, revealing the secret in process. Bob sees Alice's on-chain transaction and uses its revealed secret to claim the Lightning Network payment Alice sent him earlier. If Alice does not reveal the secret, the on-chain payment contains a refund condition that allows Bob to spend it back to himself after a time lock expires. Most of the process is trustless, so neither party has an opportunity to steal from the other provided that the software operates and is operated correctly. The exception is that the creation of the initial on-chain transaction and the possible need for Bob to create a refund transaction. If the trustless exchange does not happen, Bob will receive no compensation for the on-chain transaction fees required for both of those transactions. According to the Loop documentation, their implementation has Alice send Bob a small trusted payment via the Lightning Network in advance of the trustless exchange as an act of good faith and as an insurance that the operation won't end up costing Bob money. By allowing Alice and Bob to swap on-chain and off-chain funds, all while continuing to use their existing channels, Loop helps users to keep their channels open longer and make it conceivable that they could stay open indefinitely. Square Crypto Developer Group announced. The CEO of Square, Jack Dorsey, announced on Twitter that they are forming a group to employ several crypto uh, contributors to open source Bitcoin projects, including both developers and a designer. See their announcement for application instructions. Note, Square is also a sponsorship member of Bitcoin Optech. Uh, thank you very much, Square and Jack Dorsey, uh, for being an awesome partner uh, in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Back 32 sending support. 
week two of 24. From now until the second anniversary of the Segwit Soft Fork lock-in on August 24th, 2019, the Optech newsletter will contain this weekly section that provides information to help developers and organizations implement BAC32 sending support the ability to pay native Segwit addresses. This does not require implementing Segwit yourself, but it does allow the people you pay to access all of Segwit's multiple benefits. As described last week, implementing just Segwit spending should be easy, yet we suspect some managers might wonder whether there are enough people using Segwit to justify their team spending development effort on it. This week, we look at sites that track various Segwit adoption statistics so that you can decide whether it's popular enough that your wallet or service might become an outlier by failing to support it soon. Optech tracks statistics about Segwit in our great dashboard. Another site tracking related statistics is paytoscripthash.info. We see an average of about 200 outputs per block that are sent to native Segwit addresses, BEC32. Those outputs are spent in about 10% of all Bitcoin transactions. That makes payment involving native Segwit addresses more popular than almost all altcoins. And we see here the great statistics from the Bitcoin Optech dashboard of the transaction spending nested Segwit outputs. Uh, that is the address that starts with a three, uh, a script hash. And then transactions spending native Segwit outputs. That is back 32 addresses starting with BCQ1. And we have then uh, Segwit transactions in total, the aggregate of both of these numbers. However, many wallets want to use Segwit, but still need to deal with services that do not yet have BAC32 sending support. These wallets can generate a pay to script hash address that references their Segwit details, which is less efficient than using BAC32, but more efficient than not using Segwit at all. Because there are normal pay to script hash addresses, we cannot tell just by looking at the transaction output which pay to script hash addresses are pre Segwit pay to script hash outputs and which contain a nested Segwit commitment. And so we do not know the actual number of payments to nested Segwit addresses. However, when one of these outputs is spent, the spender reveals whether the output was Segwit. The above statistic cites report that currently about 37% of transactions contain at least one spent from a nest Segwit output that corresponds to about 1,500 outputs per block on average. Any wallet that supports pay to script hash nested Segwit addresses also likely supports BAC32 native addresses. So the number of transactions made by wallets that want to take advantage of BAC32 sending support is currently above over 45% and rising. To further gauge Segwit's popularity, you might also want to know which notable Bitcoin wallets and services support it. For that, we recommend uh, the community maintained the BEC32 adoption page and the Bitcoin wiki, or when SegWit page maintained by the Brad wallet. And we see uh, that we have several wallets uh, that currently already uh, support uh, the Bitcoin BEC32. Uh, and definitely this means uh, you should do as well. The statistic and compatibility data show that Segwit is already well supported and frequently used, but that there are a few notable holdouts that have not yet provided support. It's our hope that our campaign and other community efforts will help convince the stagglers to catch up on BEC32 sending support so that all wallets that want to take advantage of native Segwit can do so in the next few months. Selected questions and answers from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange, which is one of the first places Optech contributors look for answers to their questions, or when we have a few spare moments of time to help curious or confused users. In this monthly feature, we highlight some of the top voted questions and answers made since our last update.
There are multiple questions about the Lightning Network transport security. Rene Picard asks several questions about the encryption used to communicate Lightning Network message, such as why is message length encrypted? And what's special about Shacha 20 Poli 1305? The answers to these questions may be especially interesting in the context of the proposed BIP for the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer encrypted transport protocol, which is planned to use the same cipher. Jumping into the question by René Picard. Why is the length of transport messages on the Lightning Network encrypted? From Bold08, we can see that every message is sent in the following way. Two bytes of length, then 16 bytes of the MAC, then the length and the byte of the encrypted message, and 16 bytes again of the MAC. In reality, these messages will be sent over TCP IP on the internet. The IP header specifies the length of the data package that is being sent. If we extract the length and subtract uh, 34 bytes for the header plus the two MACs, we would know how long the message is. Is the idea to always send a 2 to the power of 16 bytes IP packages and fill the rest with junk data? If yes, why isn't that specified in the bolts? If no, why, encryption the, why encrypting the length anyway? I assume that an attacker would be able to track all TCP IP packages on the Lightning port and would at least be able to deduct which messages are being sent, even though the messaging themselves are safe. Assuming the message length can indeed be deduced, can we be used? Can it be used together with the Mac to construct the session the session key for that message? And we have a good answer here uh, by Mark H. TCP and other stream-based protocols do not have a one-to-one -one correlation of application-level messages and IP packages. If you call send three times, it might result in sending a single IP package over the wire, for example, due to Nagel's algorithm, which is enabled by default. It might get sent individually as three packages, as you would expect from a packet-oriented protocol like UDP, or other messages might end up being split into several packets, each because of the IP layer has an MTU. It is generally out of control of the application layer. You therefore cannot rely on reading the length from the IP header so to tell you about the length of a message. You need to encode the length into the data stream and reconstruct the data coming in from the stream into the individual messages as understood by your protocol. The reason to encode the length separately in the bold 8 specification is that exact message must be decrypted as a single operation because each decryption must increase the counter used by the cha cha poli cipher. You need to know exactly the length of the message before calling the decrypt function on the encrypted payload. In the bold 8 a protocol, you see the exact number of the message plus the MAC with no padded adding, no padding added. The receiver should first expire, call receive buffer 18, and so on, decrypt that result to get message len, then call receive buffer message len to retrieve the encrypted message, which can then be decrypted in full. Receive may also return fewer bytes than requested. So in both cases, to res the result of RASD must be checked, and it's, if it's less than the expected length, is ra read, receive should be called again with the remaining expected length. A very detailed answer here uh, by Mark H. Uh, did not quite understand all of this, uh, but I hope uh, you took something of value. Continuing uh, with the next question. What is so special about the Keicha Keicha 20 stream cipher along with the Poli 1305 for message authentication codes? A question asked by Rene Picard. I'm currently trying to dissect the low-level cryptography protocol of the Lightning Network, and I realize that, I'm, that in many places, Keicha Keicha 20 is being used. I tried reading about it in the Wikipedia article. There it says, and I quote, This gives Salsa 20 and ChaCha the unusual advantage that the user can effectively or 
efficiently seek to any position of the keystream in constant time. Salsa 20 offers the speeds of around 4 to 14 cycles per byte in somewhat uh, on modern x86 uh, x86 processors and reasonable hardware performance. It's not patented and the Bernstein has written several public domain implementations optimized for common architectures. While I see the latter parts about not being patented and optimized for many architectures is nice, I don't get the first sentence of the quote. What does it mean that one can efficiently seek to any position in the keystream in constant time? And we have here a great answer by Peter Bully. What is, so the question here that he quotes, what is the special about SHA-20 stream cipher along with Poly-1305 for message authentication codes? There is nothing special about the combination. It's just a combination of the two constructions, SHA-20 for the stream cipher and Poly-1305 for Mac. They are designed with similar goals in mind. Easy to write a correct implementation in software, optimized for performance of software implementations running on general purpose hardware. This is in contrast to many cryptographic primitives, which are optimized for hardware implementation, uh, but are suboptimal in software. This is mainly due to the use of integer addition operations in ChaCha20 and 128-bit security level. Furthermore, the key derivation is informally standardized, allowing using a single key to both encryption and, authent and authentication. Having real-world construction, for example, OpenSSH, use this construction gives confidence about security. And the next question that he quotes, what does it mean that one can effectively, uh, efficiently seek to any position in the keystream in constant time? Assume you are given a n gigabit of incoming encrypted data, but for some reason you're only interested in the last one megabit. While some ciphers, you'll need to do a O of n work to skip the first n gigabit. Uh, ChaCha20, like most stream ciphers, permits decrypting uh, any one megabit with the same amount of work, regardless of its position essentially deriving the cipher out for arbitrary position, aligned to a 64-byte boundary at last, at least, uh, which as much work as decoding subsequently. Now, that was a, a, great, a great question and answer here by René Picard. Multiple questions about Schnorr-based signature. Picard also asked several questions about the BIP Schnorr and Taproot and the plan to make those features available to Bitcoin transaction. See the question, will Schnorr allow a single signature per block? And does Musik have the same security as current Bic Bitcoin multisig? Uh, so first question here uh, by René Picard. When Schnorr signatures are part of Bitcoin, will it be possible to validate each block with only one signature validation? In a recent talk, Peter Woolley talked about speed up verification when using Schnorr signatures and various algorithms to verify multiple signatures. Would it really be possible to verify one single block by aggregating the keys and signatures of all transactions? In theory, even more transactions on several, over several blocks. I assume this does imply that the old ECDSA scheme would not be used anymore. If we are backwards compatible, we could probably only do this for transactions that used Schnorr signatures, whereas the others ones would have to be verified one by one. Leaving aside the, political, the politics of drastical protocol change, couldn't we even save more space if we adopt a block header to include one aggregated Schnorr signature for the block and leave out all the Schnorr signatures of the single transaction within that block? Do I miss anything? Uh, the talk did not give many details, but just mentions the idea. And we have here the long and detailed answer by Peter Woolley. Yes, one verification per block, but not one signature per block. To clear up confusion, there are three distinct technologies involved here. One, non-interactive aggregation is the ability for a third party 
who does not hold any private keys to combine multiple signatures, each with their own message and public key, into a single signature that can be verified by someone who knows all messages and public keys. Two, interactive aggregation is the same, but when the signer needs to be aware of the aggregation and communicate with each of the other jointly produce a signature, a single signature. Badge ver validation is the ability for a verifier to verify whatever multiple pubkey message signature tuples are all valid or not, faster than verifying the individual signatures. If one or more of the tuples are invalid, the verifier will not learn which one in this case. Schnorr signatures are uh, and any other known discrete logarithm-based signature schemes support two and three, but not one. The lack of one means that there cannot be a single signature for the entire block. And he links with an asterisk to, there are or there exists a form of non-interactive half aggregation of discrete log-based signature where n signatures can be non-interactively combined into a single signature of size one plus n over two original signatures. This could be used for blocks, though the gains aren't great and there are complexities around block-wide aggregation that make it less interesting. As the miner who constructs the block is a third party who is not participating in signature creation. Due to two, they're the best we can hope for, as long as we're restricted to discrete log-based signature, is one signature per transaction. Even that requires cross-input aggregation, which, is, which has complexities beyond just the implementation of on-chain Schnorr signatures. See this post, for example. However, because of three, there is a correct, it is correct that there can be a single validation per block. However, not a single signature per block. The speed up that is possible through batch validation does become non-trivial, in fact. Each of the four lines is an optimization technique that is currently implemented in LibSec P256 K1, which will pick the best one based on the size of the problem and the memory constraints. And we see here the Strauss uh, WNAF uh, Pippinger and Strauss, uh, or uh, with both uh, only N W N A F and N D U, uh, with the number of signatures, and uh, the speed up over non-batch verification. A great question, and we have the next one here from René Picard. Does Music have the same security as two of two multisig? Disclaimer. This question is of theoretical importance to me trying to educate myself better on cryptographic principles and signature schemes. I don't intend to imply that in practical, Schnorr signatures are less secure than current two out of two multi-sig transactions. I'm currently reading the MUSIC paper and about scriptless scripts. In my understanding, an important common idea in both cases seems to be uh, seems to be able to have a single signature pro produced from several private keys. Let us assume I can brute force the private key from a public key within reasonable time, let's say one month. From example, because I have somewhat efficient algorithm for the discrete log in ECDSA, which I do not have. Also assume I can invent the hash function of Bitcoin addresses quickly. Or assume we just know the public keys because I am the third party in an escrow service. Wouldn't I be able to break MUSIC addresses within one month under the above assumption? By breaking the aggregated private key to the aggregated public key, whereas, it, whereas in the setting of a common two of two multi-sig wallet, I would need two months in order to be able to provide two valid signatures, since I'd have to brute force both private keys independently of each other. 
A really good question. And we have again the answer by Peter Woolley. Are the two teaming up today? Yes or no, depending on your definition. Oh, well, that's great. You're right that the expected time for to forge a two of two multi-signature is twice that of a single signature because you obviously need to use your forger algorithm twice. However, in practice, such constant factors are ignored when describing security levels. For example, typically ED255519 and SECP256K1 are placed in the same group of 128-bit security, despite the factor that SACP256K1 needs on average four times more iterations of Pollard's row algorithm to break the discrete log problem. One of the other hand, due to the SACP256K1's efficiently computable uh, endomorphism, Individual iterations of the algorithm are 1.7x faster than we would be expected otherwise. Furthermore, the unit there is specified in its vague when talking about elliptical curve discrete log problems. The security level is usually specified in terms of the number of elliptical curve multiplications, but an elliptical curve multiplication is not a trivial thing nor is its performance identical across curves. However, when, taking, when talking about things in order of a 2 out of 128 of factor 10, here or there uh, only changes the exponent by 3.3. It gets even fuzzier when you take into account specialized hardware that could be built for certain tasks, making it even harder to compare. The point is that we don't know how long things take for an attacker. We only care that they are so long that no attacker could conceivably use them to pose a real threat. If it takes too long for, to forge two signatures, it very likely also takes too long to break one. A really insightful answer here from Peter Woolley, and again, great question from Rene. And the third question, how were the parameters for sec p 256 k one curve chosen? This is the elliptical curve used in Bitcoin. Some curve parameters play an important role in security, so it's useful to know whether those parameters were chosen wisely. Other parameters do not matter much for security, but their history might be interesting anyway. In his answer, Gregory Maxwell provides the history he's learned so far an explanation of why it's still open issue questions don't affect security and why we might never learn any more about the origins of certain curve parameters. Oh, I have not yet opened this. Here we go. The question by Pedro uh, Consalves. What is the reasoning behind the choice of 2 to the power of 256 minus 2 to the power of 32 minus 977 for the prime on sec p256 k1 curve? In Bitcoin's elliptical curve, sec p256 sec p k1, the primer, uh, this right here, uh, the generator point, this right here, and the y coordinate as well, and the order of group generated by g, uh, the n of 0 xf, continuing, uh, are predefined. What is the reasoning behind this? Why are these values more secure or efficient than any other ones? And here we have the answer by the one and only gmax. SECP256K1 was designed to be the 256-bit size elliptical curve without cofactor and admitting an efficient endomorphism for optimization purposes. The choices of the irrelevant parameters are derived from these criteria. P is selected allows a more efficient implementation on general purpose computers. See Solinia's paper on generalized Mersenet numbers. We don't know exactly search pro uh, procedures, Certicom, uh, used to select P, but it's the first primer you get if you search uh, this right here. We know, however, that this may not be the exact procedure they would have needed because of the presence of endomorphisms requirement, a cube root of utility. 
see this answer on the crypto stack exchange, but they could have searched this way and got lucky. The generator could be just any point in the curve, and it is trivial to prove that the choice of generator is irrelevant to the security of any scheme that does not involve coercing values into curve points and pretty narrowly relevant otherwise. We have not yet been able to uncover how G was selected, but it, I did discover that it, uh, that it is a value that was likely obtained by doubling a point with a very small 166-bit X coordinate. The same value was used in several other ECC standards. I won't be surprised if it was the hash of someone's name or something silly like that. <laughs> But it seems that this trivia might have been followed uh, Scott Van Stones uh, to his grave. Since the curve order is prime, the order of G is not per parameter so much as the result of the selection of the field and the curve equation. B is the curve equation, being 7 was almost certainly just because it was the first value that gives a secure curve, A being 0, is a necess necessary condition uh, for the endomorphism. You might also find this old thread on Bitcoin Talk interesting. A great answer here by G. Maxwell. Again, cryptography is difficult. All we can do is try to understand all this. Uh, what addresses should I support when uh, developing a wallet? A developer asks whether we should support both pay to public key hash uh, that is a one addresses or pay to script wrapped segwit that is a three address or whether it's safe to just provide uh, a pay to script hash address andrew chow answers that just a pay to script address is enough gregory maxwell extends this by saying that if developers did decide to display two addresses a better combination would be paid to script hash wrapped SegWit addresses and a native SegWit back 32 address, which is BC1. And uh, we have the question by Malone. If I was developing a Bitcoin wallet, should I support both legacy and compatibility addresses? To receive funds, I was thinking to give a user the option to displace two QR codes. One, legacy, a pay to public key hash, uh, and two, compatibility, pay to script hash or pay to witness public key hash. It, is it safe to only give them the option uh, of receiving to a compatibility address? Uh, Gregory Maxwell answers, displaying two would be justified if you were asking about the back one pay to witness public key hash versus a three pay to script hash of a pay to witness public key hash. Because not everyone supports back 32 but it's pretty good to use when supported. Displaying two isn't useful because pay to public key and pay to script key, as you've asked uh, about, because pay to script hash is supported everywhere and many wallets and services have used pay to script hash exclusively uh, for a long time. Supporting plain pay to public key hash is not something I'd recommend a new wallet bother doing. Uh, that development and testing effort well, would better be spent on newer functionality. And we have the answer by Andrew Chow, uh, quoting the question, is it safe to only give them the option of receiving to a compatibility address? Yes, all modern wallets uh, software understand pay to script hash, and we create transactions that send to such addresses. Uh, thank you for both of the answers and the very good question. Jumping back into the newsletter with the notable code and documentation changes this week in Bitcoin Core, LND, C Lightning, Eclair, LipsecP, 256K1, and Bitcoin Improvement Proposals. This Bitcoin Core change makes Bitcoin Core's built in wallet component access information about the blockchain through a well defined interface rather than directly assessing functions and variables on the node component. There are no user visible changes associated with this update, but the merge is notable because it is the last of a set of functional refactorings that should make it easy for future changes to run a node and the wallet GUI in separate processes. Uh, see, Bitcoin, see this Bitcoin Core merge for one approach to this, as well as improving the modularity of the Bitcoin Core codebase and allowing more focused component testing. 
besides laying the groundwork for major changes to come. Uh, this pull request is notable for being open for over year, a year and a half, receiving almost 200 code review comments and replies and running over 150 updates and rebases. Optech thanks the pull request author, Russell Yanovsky, for his amazing dedication in seeing this pull request through to merge. Outstanding work. Thank you very much. This Bitcoin Core merge omits sending address messages containing IP addresses of peers to the node currently has on its ban list. This prevents your node from telling other nodes about peers it found to be abusive. This Bitcoin Core node modifies the send raw transaction RPC to replace the allow high fee parameter with a max fee rate parameter. The earlier parameter, if set to true, would send the transaction, even if the total fee exceeded the amount set by the max transaction fee configuration option, the default being 10 million satoshis. The new parameter takes a fee rate and will reject the transaction if its fee rate is above the provided value, regardless of the setting of max transaction fee. If no value is provided, it's, it'll only uh, send the transaction to its fee if its fee is below the max transaction fee total. This l and change uh, changes how the Lightning Network code responds to channel breaches attempted theft. Previously, if the attempted breach was detected, the node created a breach remedy transaction to collect all funds associated with that channel. However, when users start using watchtowers, the watchtower may create a breach remedy transaction, but not include all the possible funds. This does not mean the watchtower is malicious. Your node may simply not have had a chance to tell the watchtower about the latest commitments it accepted. This pull request updates the logic used to generate the breach remedy transaction so that it only collects the funds that have not been collected by prior breach remedy transactions, allowing recovery of any funds the watchtower did not collect. This Lightning Network change increases the default address look-ahead value during the recovery from 250 to 2,500. This is the number of keys derived from an HD seed that the wallet uses when rescanning the blockchain for your funds. Previously, if your node gave out more than 250 addresses or pub keys without any of them being used, your node would not find your complete balance on its first rescan, requiring you to initiate additional attempts. Now you'd need to give up more than 2,500 addresses before reiterating might be necessary. An earlier version of this pull request wanted to set the value to 25,000, uh, but there were concerns that this would significantly slow down rescanning with the BIP 158 Neutrino implementation. So the value was decreased until it could be shown that people needed a value that high. Note, checking addresses against BIP158 filters is very fast by itself. The problem is that any match requires downloading and scanning the associated blocks, even if it's a false positive match. The more addresses you check, the greater the number of expected false positives, so scanning becomes slower and requires more bandwidth. And we have this C Lightning merge, which modifies the recent added set channel fee RPC so that all can be passed instead of the specific node ID in order to set the routing fee for all the channels. And this Eclair change updates Eclair to be compatible with Bitcoin Core version 0 0.17 and the upcoming Bitcoin Core version 0 0.18, dropping support for 0 0.16. Pierce, you got to describe to the you got to subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. Thank you very much to the founding sponsors and all the contributors, as well as the sponsors of this great open source initiative. Thank you very much for joining me here on the reading of the World Crypto Network, and see you on the next show. Bye bye.